So the tragic story of Freud's life, the tragic story of psychoanalysis at the beginning, because Freud, and we will see that he can be presented and because we talk about psychoanalysis today, because psychoanalysis is a widely known and widely spread practice and theory school. And it is quite success, the story of success, right? Because we, it's well known. But behind every story of success, there is also a story of a failure. And it's kind of a true story. The, fa the story of a failure is a true story because you need to, a lot of failures to get maybe something that will be seen as a story of success. And if it's presented only as a story of success, it's kind of not true. And um, it's not only a story of psychoanalysis that is a story of failure, and not only a story of Freud, is a story of failure of, of himself, and psychoanalysis is a story of failure of itself. It's also the, the story of life is uh, tragic. The story of... Uh, how life goes, well, you know, there is death at the end. So it doesn't end, if you didn't know. So it doesn't end well for, for anyone of us. And you need the special point of view to present it as a successful life. But it won't always be true. This, the story of success, the story of only positive coherent story is um, a secondary vision. If you go deeper, you will discover something else. You will discover its tragic side. And it's very important, in my view, to see the tragic side. And this is why, this is one of the reasons, the main reason uh, I like psychoanalysis, basically, because it's a failure. And um, it's also a story of my life, uh, partially, because what we're going to do during the lecture, we're going to uh, debunk psychoanalysis, criticize it, that wrong psychoanalysis, see it as a failure, but also, so go away from psychoanalysis, but also come back to psychoanalysis, and this is what I did in my life too. I went away, uh, but uh, it turned out that it's even worse outside of psychoanalysis. <laughs> Failure is even maybe not greater, but um, yeah. But the failure of science, for example, is failure that I don't I'm not able to tolerate as well as, the, as I'm able to tolerate the story, the failure of psychoanalysis. So I came back. Uh, to psychoanalysis, so it's my failure as well, and my, my tragedy as well, being stuck in psychoanalysis maybe. And also this psychoanalysis, especially late Freud, the Freud uh, that talks about death and that includes death drive into psychoanalysis, for me is, the, is this part, the hopeless part, where he becomes kind of hopeless, is the, the hopeless Freud is my hope. So this part of psychoanalysis, which I would call negative psychoanalysis, um, unlike other types of uh, talking therapy, unlike other types of psychology, and Freud with his psychoanalysis was the one who started the, the very practice of talking therapies. There, there are a lot, lot of types now, but they are mostly, they constitute the positive project. What they suggest is the positive project of, um, they offer kind of a hope for positive stories of our life, that they can be successful stories. They kind of, they're not hopeless enough for me. They cover the truth of life, the tragic truth of life, the life as a failure. And uh, Freud, disillusion Freud, late Freud, not early Freud. Um, because early Freud is the one, early, early psychoanalysis is the one that started all the positive types of uh, psychologies. But late Freud, the one who became disillusioned in psychoanalysis, um, the hopeless one. And uh, psychoanalysis that still functions but that functions as a failure is the psychoanalysis I basically like. It looks more truthful to me. So uh, Killstrom claims that, and we know it, uh, that uh, Freud is quite influential, that uh, he's more influential for our culture than uh, Einstein and even Lenin and even Beatles. And it's not only that it influenced uh, the culture, it's not only that his name is well known and psychoanalysis is well known, but Freud exists kind of within us. Uh, we internalized Freud uh, because uh, the way we think about ourselves, about ourselves now, we kind of reproduce Freud. It's inner Freud. It's not necessarily the name of a Freud 
and his theories that we read, we need even know, we even think in his terms uh, before we read Freud or before we read anything on, on psychoanalysis. And Philip Reeve, I'm not going to discuss him that much today. Philip Reeve, a sociologist, claimed that uh, Freud is responsible, is one who is responsible for switching or shifting the very cultural uh, framework of our existence. So the type that appeared, the type of human, and the type of society culture that appeared after Freud, uh, after Freud invented psychoanalysis is completely, not completely, but radically different from the culture and type of human that exists before. What Philip Reeves called, uh, predicted, is the existence of therapeutic society and existence of psychological man, or psychological human, it's better to say, um, that came uh, to replace the moral or religious man. So before, before psychoanalysis was widespread, because before uh, psychology as such was uh, so widespread, uh, there were no psychologists, right? The dominant uh, discourse was religious discourse or moral discourse. When people were reflecting on themselves, they were not using psychological terms like we do now, because the way we think about ourselves now automatically um, is, psycho is uh, psychological discourse, right? We think either our relationship are healthy or either we, uh, how do we feel psychologically? If, it, if it's something is psychologically healthy, if, if is it traumatic for us? We are psychological. Before that, uh, the type of human were different. People were not thinking in this terms. They were thinking in terms maybe how moral they are, how uh, sinful they are, uh, the, how they feel psychologically and where something was traumatic and psychologically unhealthy wasn't even the problem. And uh, for this switch in appearance, uh, the fact that the new human came to existence. Re Philip Reeve uh, claims that it's Freud endeavor or uh, Freud input was uh, great precisely in this pro process. And according to Philip, Philip Reeve, uh, he basically criticizes, he's more conservative, he would prefer, uh, it looks like he would prefer to come back to the moral man, the heroic man, the heroic human, instead of the uh, psychological human that was promoted by Freud. But uh, precisely one of the reasons, because according to Reef, and it's partially true, what psychological humans are mostly interested in is uh, if they want to be pleased, right? They want to feel good. Uh, they are self-enclosed and what bothers them is how, how, how good they feel and how healthy they are psychologically. They're kind of within themselves. And um, for moral man, it was different. It was either his or her uh, soul is, I don't know, uh, sinful or not sinful. So this is the great switch of who we are. And this is Freud is the one who uh, is responsible for, for it. Um, so the friends uh, claim that the problem with this success story, uh, the problem with Freud being popular and Freud uh, being so well known and uh, being the person who started a psychological discourse, promoted psychological, psychoanalytical discourse, is that uh, he was wrong, fantastically wrong about nearly every important thing he had to say. But um, there are indefinitely infinitely creative uh, efforts to whitewash his errors. And uh, yeah, so this is, this is actually what happens. From the point of view of, uh, of science, Freud is criticized, let's see. And there are reasons for it. And some people even claim that it's better to, to completely for psychology to be scientific and to, for psychology to move forward uh, it's better to completely forget Freud, not to come back to Freud. But um, it's also, the science itself is, is questionable. It, science sometimes presents itself as being completely objective, but uh, sometimes 
or most of the time, it kind of hides its own pre prejudice uh, instead of self-reflecting. Um, we are talking about Freud. And uh, so from the point of view of science, it's, it's not, uh, it is criticized, wi widely criticized. And it, there, there is the, the reason that uh, it actually exists this whitewashing Freud, because if you go into psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis does look like sex right, like the church or something. Um, according to Reef, even though it came to um, substitute church, it still has lots of features. Um, not only uh, him, but also other researchers will talk about Foucault a little bit today. Um, it still preserves a lot of features of the church and it does function as a sect. It has its own special language that is hard to understand and that you need to share with each, with each other uh, to uh, discuss something in psychoanalysis. So it imposes its own special language to understand reality. It also, uh, in the same way, well, it, it does um, assumes its own superiority in comparison to other discourses, but uh, every discourse that does it um, suggests that it's uh, superior. It's also the problem that if you're trained in psychoanalysis or if you read Lacan, for example, uh, he's very hard to read. You know, uh, it's very hard, or if you get diploma in psychoanalysis, it's very hard to say <laughs> this is something uh, you need to abandon, right? Because you spend time, you learn this language, and it's very hard after this process to, to criticize it, to, to leave it, because you, you have to start from scratch. So this is how, and this is how sex, sex uh, function. And also to become a psychoanalyst, you have to go through, through a long practice. It takes time, it costs money. Um, and after all that, you can just say that, you know, <laughs> why was I doing that? So it does, it, it does has this, um, it does has this element. And uh, therefore, if you have diploma in psychoanalysis, you, you, you can't uh, that throne uh, the monk Freud, because Freud is your life, is uh, my way is to be in, in, in psychoanalysis and criticize psychoanalysis, but um, it's still pathetic. So let's talk about Freud, personal failure in life. So Freud was born in, uh, he was Jewish, he is Jewish, he was born in a uh, poor family. Uh, in Freiburg, Moravia, the Austrian Empire, now it's in Czechia. His parents were born in Ukraine, close to where I was born, but we are not related, I checked. Um, and Freud, um, he had a lot of siblings, he didn't. He had a lot of siblings, even though the family was poor. He developed the love of uh, the love to literature. He really liked to, uh, to read. He was reading from young age, uh, Shakespeare, Kant, Hegel, uh, Nietzsche, and uh, Schopenhauer. Well, those not from young age, a little bit later, but he, he did uh, like to read. He was really disciplined uh, learner and he was preferred uh, by his mother and by his father. He were, they were giving him uh, private education before he went to gymnasium, the year before uh, children normally, when they're, I think, in the age of nine. And uh, he actually was preferred and his family, his parents um, tried to create a favorable atmosphere for Freud uh, to study. Uh, and they did prefer him uh, in comparison to their other children. For example, when Freud uh, was studying, other children supposed to be quiet, and uh, Freud uh, was able to use kerosene lamp, while other children were using uh, just candles, studying with candles. And uh, they were not allowed to do their music lessons when Freud was learning. And later Freud uh, would claim that uh, he found that children who are preferred or favored by their mothers give evidence in their life uh, of a peculiar self-reliance and unshakable optimism. 
which often brings actual success to their possessors. And this is what happened. This is uh, the self-reliance and because of love uh, of his mother and of his parents, this is what he will carry all uh, his life. But at the same time, this, this played a cruel joke on him because first of all, to prefer a child, you have to uh, treat uh, in a worse way other children. Like, <laughs> like you need this contrast with other children. And uh, it's not that good <laughs> for, for other children, right? To, um, to favor someone. And the, 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 the cruel jo jo uh, job that displayed on uh, Freud was optimism no matter what, that he feels love no matter what in comparison with, uh, with other children, the sense of superiority that it gave him and the sense of maybe arrogance, uh, standing on his um, ideas, even if other people are criticizing him. Um, this is the partially uh, the reason why psychoanalysis was successful, this feature of his uh, character. And as well, uh, the feature of his character that, uh, played uh, again, a cruel joke later in his life and how psychoanalysis, why psychoanalysis uh, functions as a failure is partially uh, because of this. And this is the, some events from uh, Freud early years. In 1973, he became a medical student at Vienna University. He wasn't interested in medicine. He wasn't, he didn't want to be a doctor and he would explicitly later in his life, he would claim that it's not his interest. But uh, because of the anti-Semitic uh, tendencies uh, in Austria and Germany, uh, it, it wasn't, uh, he didn't have much choice. So um, medicine was uh, worked uh, for him. And he graduated in 1881. And it's interesting that he had to uh, he had to take year off for uh, army military training, and this is the time when he was. I just learned it recently. I didn't know that. And he took this time. He used this time of military training to translate Mill, John Stuart Mill. We'll mention him maybe later when we'll talk about pleasure principle. The year before, uh, the year after he will graduate, he meets uh, Marta Bernays his future wife, the one who he married in 1886, who also plays an important role in the development of psychoanalysis. Well, the fact of her existence, the fact of their marriage uh, plays a role. He uh, later worked at uh, Vienna General Hospital, first at the, uh, first at the neuropsychological department and then uh, neurology department and then in psychiatry department. In 1884, uh, his paper on coca was published on cocaine. Then he went 85 uh, to work with Charcot. You remember Du Charcot? That's the one. Uh, that's the one he would undertake um, study training with and 1886 marry Marta Bernay. So this was before his uh, early years before he established this, uh, sick, he established the practice of psychoanalysis and started to develop a theory of psychoanalysis. And it, this is already, so his, his greatest failure of life is psychoanalysis, his greatest success and his greatest failure. But this is, uh, this timeline describes other uh, big failures too, we might say failures, uh, his failure that precedes his greatest failure, the failure of Freud as a scientist. And well, basically two of those failure, a uh, failure of Freud as a scientist first is connected with neurobiology. And next, uh, another one is connected with his um, research on cocaine and promotion of cocaine. And uh, the two failures before the greatest failure, Freud, yeah, when he was studying, because he was Jewish, when he was studying at the university, we'll go, we'll go through all of those stages, uh, through all of the timeline now. When he studied at the university in Vienna, when he was a medical student in Vienna, 
he wasn't treated that well because he was Jews. He, he was ridiculed. Uh, he wasn't treat, uh, treated in a nice way. But it, he claims that he learned uh, because of this to uh, stand, to be able to stand in opposition and being placed under a ban and uh, to be in opposition with the majority. And this again helped him to develop self reliance, to be able to. Uh, develop independent thinking, no matter what other people think. Uh, so he kind of had this complex superiority complex, right? Because uh, because of his mother, uh, self reliance because he was favored, and uh, but at the same time because he was Jewish, uh, it was uh, not possible for him not to have inferiority, the opposite complex, and basically they both of them go together because. For superiority complex, it's also it uh, has to kind of cover something. You uh, to affirm yourself, you need to have reason for it. You need to doubt yourself, right? To compensate for it, uh, to feel superior. Uh, if you don't have inferiority, the feeling of inferiority, you, you don't need to. There is no need for you just to uh, to affirm to try to prove your superiority even to yourself. So they do function as in a dialectic. Uh, this is a drawing of Freud uh, during uh, when he was a medical student and he started his research in uh, zoology in Brücke's laboratory. Uh, he he uh, was uh, doing research on uh, lamprey spinal cord and lamprey uh, nerve cells, lamprey brain. And you do recognize it, it looks familiar, like something from contemporary, from more recent neurobiology. And in 8084, on a conference, he would preserve, uh, it's not necessary to read it, just to grab the, the, the general idea. So he would uh, discuss the idea of uh, existence of a nerve cells and doing research on nerve cells and uh, brain matter. Um, and this was the time before contemporary uh, neuroscience was born. And scientists where there was an argument between within the scientific circle between reticularists and neuronists. Uh, reticularists believe that uh, brain consists of a continuous network of nerve matter. And uh, neuronists be believe that uh, brain consists of separate cells what we now call, well, what they were called before, neurons. Uh, and Freud research testified in favor of neuronists. And now we know that it's actually true. Freud uh, was trying to develop a technique to color the neurons. This is how we now know that we, this is how we become, we started to know that uh, cells are separate uh, the uh, brain cells and neurons are separate cells because of the because Santiago Ramon and Cajal developed uh, his uh, coloring uh, technique using silver he was able to color um, each neuron to see that it's a separate cell and he was able to see in a microscope that it's a separate cell and this is his one of the first drawings of the um, of neurons right so uh, Santiago Ramon and Cajal did something that Freud could do, but Freud, um, Freud research wasn't, Freud methods were not as good, maybe he wasn't as lucky as Santiago Ramon and Cajal, and uh, he would get, Ramon and Cajal would get Nobel Prize for it, and he, he is now known as a father of neuroscience, as a very serious, uh, undoubtedly serious uh, scientist who studied objective science, who studied something in a microscope, um, studied cells, studied brain. No one doubts, unlike uh, people doubt Freud, uh, Santiago Ramon Cajal. And so it could be Freud, right? But he wasn't. Now we don't even remember that there is something about neuroscience in Freud. Santiago Ramon Cajal even mentions Freud in one of his work, he refers to Freud uh, research. But um, it's a for, for scientists, uh, for neuroscientists, Freud switch to uh, psychoanalysis to subjective research is, a, is Freud's uh, failure. 
the fact that um, so after graduating from university, he met uh, Marta Bernays, fell in love with her, but uh, he wasn't, uh, he didn't have enough income to start a family. And it wasn't uh, easy for him to get an income because he was Jewish, because of the anti-Semitic tendencies. And uh, he couldn't make money uh, being a scientist. So he had to switch. Uh, he had to establish his own medical practice or some kind of practice. And this is what he did. He made this switch. Also another failure uh, at the same time is his paper on cocaine. So around this time, a little bit before this paper was uh, published, he became interested in the effects of cocaine. He read the paper and uh, the most problematic thing is that he started ex ex experimenting on himself with cocaine. He became addicted. Even worse, uh, he uh, made his future wife addicted to cocaine and basically was recommended, so like a drug dealer, and was recommended to use cocaine to his friends and uh, colleagues. Uh, he uh, he was propagating cocaine and he was suggesting that um, so he was basically interested in in the effects of cocaine such as uh, the cocaine as antidepressant is something that reduces fatigue and uh, as uh, analgetic and in uh, he also recommended to uh, to use cocaine prescribed cocaine to his friend von Marxa. Uh, who was already sick and who became addicted to it and uh, who would later die uh, because of it. And uh, when uh, von Marco was already addicted to it, Freud in a couple of years later, in uh, 85 or one year later after publishing this, uh, this paper. So his friend who, is going, who was going to die was addicted to it and he still was guaranteeing uh, that even though cocaine might have some negative effects, it's not addictive. And he only uh, abandoned it in 80, I think 87, for, for promoting cocaine and guaranteeing that it's not addictive, that uh, people should use it. And at that time, the negative effects of cocaine were, were widely known, that it's addictive, that it's harmful, don't use it. And uh, so until the end, this is the problem again with the self-reliance, with not hearing others, with independent thinking that you might be kind of dangerous for society with your ideas without listening to others. This is what you need, the self-reliance, independence from, from the, uh, what others are telling you. You do need it to develop some interesting uh, new thoughts, but it also has this danger of you being propagating something that is against society, something that is harmful for society. And you know, you never know how to, uh, how to ex exist within this ambiguity. Um, later, he would go to, uh, he would win a grant to study with, in 1885, to study with Charcot, one with Du Charcot. Uh, Charcot was in Paris, he was practicing uh, hypnosis with nervous uh, patients, uh, mostly women, uh, hysterical patients, hysterichki in Russian. Um, and uh, Freud uh, was looking forward to go and to, uh, to learn uh, from him. And there is also a rumor that it was hard for, so to get this brand, uh, there was a committee who was voting for the candidates and Freud need to talk privately uh, to uh, some of the members of the committee to ensure that they will vote, vote for him. So it's not really ethical thing to do. So he did won this, um, this grant. He went to Paris, he would write to Marta that uh, he will come with money because this is the time, bless you. This is the time uh, before they got married and that he will cure all the incurable ner nervous cases and uh, he will be healthy and happy. So here we can see again this intention, this quite messianic uh, intention uh, about him talking about huge uh, halo um, nymph. 
So we see messianic attempts quite which are connected with a religious type of perception perception of the world, the cure suffering of the world, right? Uh, and you are the one who is healing the world from the, uh, from the suffering. Um, so he did um, study with Charcot and after he will come back next year, uh, he would establish, he would marry uh, Martha and Eric Kendall, uh, neuro contemporary neuroscientists, respected neuroscientists claimed that uh, if it would be possible for scientists of, of that time, Jewish scientists of that time to ensure uh, to get a living wage, uh, Freud would be known as a neuroanatomist or co-founder of neuron doctrine instead of the father of psychoanalysis. So he might, uh, basically the fact that psychoanalysis exists, um, the reason for it might be the fact that Freud needed to establish a family and later feed uh, their kids. And uh, this is why he abandoned uh, real science, what is called <laughs> by scientists, and uh, become uh, the practical, uh, practice, established his practice and uh, invented psychoanalysis. But also Eric Kendall is uh, one of the scientists who claimed that psychoanalysis is uh, still represents the most coherent and intellectually satisfying view of the mind. It was published in 1999. Uh, but he's criticizing the later development of uh, psychoanalysis, claiming that Freud still had those scientific um, intentions. He wanted, uh, he partially abandoned it, uh, his scientific uh, intentions to combine science with objective science with uh, psychoanalysis. And uh, later, psychoanalysis, according to Kendall, it abandoned it even more instead of going into the, this direction. But there are some, uh, some scientific types of psychoanalysis, like neuropsychoanalysis, where it's Mark Solms, who try to connect neuroscience with, um, with psychoanalysis. So uh, after some time, after he came back from Paris, he would... Uh, Establish his own office in the same house he's going to live with, with uh, his wife, Marta, and with their kids on Bergasa 19 in Vienna. And this is going to be his office for more than or for less than half a century. This is the place he would accept his uh, patients. This is the couch. The couch now is in London Museum, I think. Um, so the beginning of psychoanalysis. After coming back from, uh, from Paris, he, he, started to practice, uh, uh, he started to practice as a doctor with uh, his friend Breyer, the one with, with whom uh, they will later, based on their experience, will write a work studies on hysteria, which sometimes considered in 1895, uh, which sometimes considered as a beginning of psychoanalysis, beginning of psychoanalytic uh, theory. And, uh, but basically it was not Freud invention, the talking therapy. It was a Breuer and uh, Freud client uh, patient invention. The one who is known in literature is Anna O. Uh, Anna O, so initially they were practicing uh, hypnosis after Freud came back from uh, studying with Charcot, but uh, he wasn't fully satisfied with the results of hypnosis, the way it works. And uh, he started to experimenting with letting patients, uh, precisely Anna O, talk about uh, their experience. And this worked uh, better. They would claim they would write in studies on hysteria that um, to their great surprise, unexpectedly, <laughs> they found that uh, just talking uh, bring into clarity, bring into light, to light a memory of a traumatic event uh, that causes uh, the hysterical symptoms. It already helps. So just talking about it helps. It was not the invention. It was Anna O, oh, the patient inventions, who called it the talking therapy and who claimed that it just works when she talks about it. But uh, it looked like a revolutionary. <laughs> A revolutionary invention uh, to just talk and 
assuming that talking helps, but those women, it was mostly women, hysterical women, were treated as objects, right? Um, a sick object, there is something wrong with them. No one ever listened to them. And Freud uh, was the first, one of the first one who was actually listening what they are talking about. Of course, you're gonna be hysterical, right? If you, if you treat it that way, if you treat it as a sick person who's doing something weird, abnormal, and you need to be, uh, something has to be done with you. So you will behave normal, not be hysterical anymore. Of course, you. <laughs> Of course, you'll behave that way. And if you if you have a chance to talk and to explain your traumatic um, the traumatic events in your life, of course, it's helpful. And you're not treated as an object, but treated as a subject, as someone who is listened to. So it helped to Anna. Oh, we are mm, supposed to thank her for establishment of this practice, but. On the other side, and we'll talk uh, about it when we'll talk about Manique Vedic, it's still a uh, kind of objectification of patients that is happening in psychoanalysis. They're not treating precisely as subjects that are respected. They're treated like still like, uh, like sick people who need to be uh, changed and psychoanalysts for some reason know how to, uh, how to change them, normalize them. And Malcolm Macmillan would claim that, so for scientists, uh, Freud abandoning laboratory work, so abandoning objective science, studying cells uh, was a failure, uh, is considered to be a, favor, a failure of uh, Freud as a scientist, because Freud switched from the research on brain, from something you can see, count, objective science, to a subjective science, when you uh, listen to your patients and this is your research. Uh, and you uh, try to uh, come uh, with some kind of hypothesis, how psyche, how mind works, and you test those hypotheses with, uh, uh, during your practice. But uh, it's also problematic because uh, there's supposed to be a special framework for it, for this practice to be, come, to be considered scientific. And Freud framework of his work wasn't exactly scientific framework. So the fact that you don't do something with people, talk to them, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, it's a scientific, scientifically approved uh, practice. And Freud, uh, even when he started to practice psychoanalysis, he, he had the intention to combine uh, research in biology, research in neurobiology with, uh, with his research of uh, patients, of their minds and psyche. But, uh, the biology and neurobiology of this time didn't develop to like bold hypothesis to say something new. They didn't even know neurons work that well and how to connect it. So it's only started to be possible more or less now. And it's also questionable if it's, um, if it's possible, if it, this connection is relevant. So we have psychoanalysis with its crazy hypothesis, crazy in a good way, well, in a bad way too. Precisely because he abandoned science, because precisely because he was free from the um, from some of the obstacles that science had, from the some of the from the reduced opportunities of science. So psychoanalysis, something that Freud invents, it became a therapy, it became a theory of human psyche and a special object for the interpretation of culture and uh, society. Um, and self-enclosed, self-functioning uh, mechanism. We will discuss some, uh, some concept of, uh, of psychoanalysis to maybe explain better how psychoanalysis functions. We'll talk about the pleasure principle and uh, the death drive mostly during next, my next lecture. And just now, maybe to give you ideas through still relying on uh, Freud life, uh, what is the early Freud and what is the late Freud and what is the Freud uh, failure. So initially, remember I told you that when he was a student and he had to go on medical, uh, not medical, but mi military training, he was translating uh, John Stuart Mill and John Stuart Mill is utilitarian. So utilitarian, utilitarian, he was utilitarian. 
So it, it suggests that um, a special understanding of humans that uh, happy, that society, the successful society, uh, a society that needs to be established on uh, just understanding of the individual of subject suggests that they want to be happy. This we measure it all in personal, uh, personal happiness and the absence of suffering. And this is more or less framework that we still exist now, the framework of perceiving individuals, how we perceive individuals, we perceive them through this perspective that we want to be happy. This is how we measure our life. We don't want to suffer. And this was initial uh, Freud's perspective uh, with the pleasure principle. Uh, the, it's, it's very close to meal understanding of uh, humans that we have this instinct to seek pleasure and avoid of pain. And this is basically the, the basic core uh, way of explaining the humans, of understanding humans. Uh, Freud would claim that, I think it's from beyond the pleasure principle, I'm not sure. So they do strive, they strive for happiness, they want to become happy and remain so. And this endeavor has two sides, a positive and negative. And they want absence of pain and uh, they want to avoid unpleasure and they want to experience the strong, uh, uh, strongest pleasure and become happy. So this is the program of the pleasure principle. This is how initially Freud uh, understand humans, that pleasure is what we want. And within this framework, we are, uh, we are egoistic because our pleasure is, uh, because pleasure is our pleasure, right? We are narcissistic. We are not um, pro-social. We are not altruistic. This is, this is not possible uh, within this perspective. And uh, building up on the pleasure principle, Freud develops his understanding, which is sexual as well. Uh, Freud's build up his initial uh, framework of perception human or perception society, um, sexual plus pleasure principle, and his practice of psychoanalysis, because again, this intention to reduce pleasure, to make uh, someone maybe not happy, but just to reduce pleasure, to, um, to make them suffer less. It has also to do with the idea of sublimation, uh, the process of uh, deflecting sexual instinct into act of higher social uh, valuation. And um, so the pleasure principle, and this was his, uh, the reason why they broke with Breuer, his, uh, his friend, the one who he shared, Anna O, his, uh, his patient with, uh, Breuer didn't believe that uh, the unconscious, that our unconscious is sexual, that all of those traumatic uh, problems, traumatic events and, uh, of uh, hyster hysterics is of a sexual nature, while Freud did, and Jung didn't believe in that too, that it's all sexual. Uh, Freud did, and it would be claimed now that uh, Freud discourse in uh, Freud concentration on sexuality uh, is not what Freud is concentrating on is not sexuality or sexual instinct in a common sense of word, especially in Lacanian psychoanalysis, it starts to be the sexual uh, words that are connected to sexuality uh, function within a framework of symbolic and they're kind of detached from the um, from sexuality in a common sense understanding of the world word. And it would be claimed that Freud, for Freud, they were detached too, but it's not true. Um, Freud did claim that, uh, Freud did reduce initially all love to the sexual instinct. He wasn't able to comprehend love uh, outside of this uh, framework of uh, sexuality. And he would claim uh, in sexual morality and nervousness that the sexual instinct, he actually believed that the difference between humans and other animals, as he was interested in zoology, is that their sexual instinct is more developed. This is their, uh, the feature that this, for Freud uh, that distinguishes human from animal. And uh, sexuality, sexual instinct in a very um, common understanding of the word. Of the word. Um, and when some of the terms that are related to uh, 
sexuality are used, for example, in uh, Lacanian psychoanalysis. And it's claimed that it's not the sexuality, it's not the, this division on sexes, uh, female and male. And um, for example, something phallic, right? Something, I feel when, when it's claimed that it's not in common use of the word, it's, uh, I feel like it's a gaslighting because <laughs> for Freud it was, it's kind of really hard to detach those terms from Freud's initial framework of thinking and now claim that it has nothing to do with this initial insight. It's not, it's not sexuality that we normally talk about. Uh, the unconscious, uh, you already know, the mental processes uh, of which individual make themselves unaware. And uh, of course it gets redefined as a psychoanalysis develops, but um, the basic idea is this. And for Freud, again, uh, unconscious was uh, something sexual. And the goal of psychoanalysis, uh, again, is to bring to light those unconscious level and uh, to make them conscious. And in order to release some emotions, in order to release memories, uh, to lead the client to uh, healing, right? But Monique Wittig, we're going to have a seminar dedicated to her and we'll discuss her. Uh, we'll have the time, uh, time to dig deeper into her, but she was the one who was criticizing psychoanalysis. She's a crazy one and I like her for that, maybe too crazy. So she's writing that psychoanalysis is oppressive as a radical feminist and because it exploits a person, a person who has a need to talk, it uh, charges money for talking, for discussing your suffering. And it also reduces the suffering into just a couple of figures of speech. And that's a, the couple of figures of speech that, you're, that your suffering is reduced is a language of psychoanalysis. So like this interpretation, the reduction of your suffering and suffering is enormous, right? It's, you can't reduce it to some kind of diagnosis. Um, well, it does reduce us to diagnosis. It's a, it exploits, according to Monique Wittig, it exploits the need of, of the attention of talking to the to other person. It imposes its own language, it's cruel, in this sense, in the charges, a suffering person for that. For Monique Wittig, the greatest problem was she talks about and discusses in the essay, The Straight Mind, that we're going to read, is that Freud was promoter of heterosexual norm, uh, that the main, the central couple of him, well, not only Freud, but all of them kind of did it. Um, for Freud, the central couple is heterosexual couple. And in heterosexual couple, uh, men and women, uh, the man, it's misogynistic and patriarchal. The man uh, in heterosexual couple and heterosexual norms suggest that man plays more active role. And uh, man as such is a prototype of human proper. Woman within the heterosexual mind framework is, is defined as deviation in comparison to the man that is a normal type of human. Woman is a deviation, woman some kind of weird deviation from the center, from the man, uh, which plays mm, less uh, active role. The man is active one. And we can see it in Freud. In Freud's theory of psychosexual development is a psychosexual development of a voice, of a man. And uh, women would be defined in relation to this, the central uh, type of um, of uh, psychosexual development of a man. For example, the girls would define uh, girls' psychosexual de development for Freud is penis envy. He actually believed that uh, girls envy the fact when they encounter the fact that boys have penis, they start to envy. And this is what de defines uh, uh, this event. This is what defines their whole life after it, that they don't have a penis. Uh, unlike girl, boys, that, and boys is the concentration anxiety that someone wants to take the, their penis away. And this is, very, <laughs> this is a very important thing. So uh, this promotion and all the, well, castration anxiety doesn't function as this, but for Freud, it was precisely this. Freud observed kids 
he came to conclusion that this is what happened. And it, now, no matter how you redefine this, no matter how you redefine those concepts like frustration, I said, it's still this basic uh, thing that Freud suggested. And, you know, it, it, the question is to uh, what extent you can uh, deprive it from this initial Freud accent, uh, from this initial Freud insight and make it something else, something more refined. It's still, you know, it's still, this is what at the, at the basis. So Manik Vidic is too crazy maybe because she claimed that the word woman shouldn't exist at all. And she wanted to substitute with the word lesbian, not with a heterosexual couple. Butler would claim, and I agree with Butler with her criticism of uh, Vidic that it's impossible just to substitute word woman because woman is defined as a deviation from man, as something as deficient man. Uh, so she, she claimed to abandon word woman, the concept of woman, because woman functions as a slave, something you want, you want to preserve the, and emancipate slave, just keep calling them slaves, you know, some, <laughs> some secondary people. You would want to get rid of the very concept, very idea of slaves. So this was her idea and she wanted to substitute it with the concept of lesbians, for her lesbians are not women. But Butler would claim that they are to define lesbians, you need to first, um, you need to first uh, uh, explain, you, you can't explain lesbianism without using the word women, right? It's still secondary in relation. So <clears throat> this is maybe not a way out, but still the inside, the problematicity of uh, what she's talking about is quite radical. And was, uh, she was criticizing psychoanalysis as oppressive, as something that imposes the heterosexual norm, as something that when you can come to psychoanalysis, they would define you in uh, and your suffering in their terms and impose uh, the, your, their gender role and their um, understanding of how gender roles are uh, function on you. And uh, yeah, and it is misogynistic. It is it is uh, concentrated on uh, on men. And uh, the other thing that she claims: who gave psychoanalysis their knowledge? Why uh, Lacan, for example, who gave Lacan his knowledge? How do he? How does he know how to interpret the unconscious, our unconscious? Well, he's dead. <laughs> Can't do it. But why do they know? Why do they uh, know our unconscious and why do their terms, why do we have to use their terms? Um, that was her critique. And it's some, uh, Michel Foucault was also criticized. I think you either was reading his, um, his no, you're going to read probably great books, uh, his history of sexuality, or maybe you won't. But Foucault is the one who is criticizing, not criticizing, but maybe analyzing psychoanalysis um, and using his concept of pastoral power, we can claim that, uh, again, he shows the similarities between pastors who were functioning within the church uh, with psychoanalysts and with the whole even medical uh, establishment. So for him, uh, pastors, uh, it, it used to be pastors and the now, now uh, psychoanalysts or all the type of counselors, um, psychotherapists came to substitute uh, pastors. Pastors, and they still function uh, some, somewhat similar with, within the democratic power, they function somehow similar like pastors did. So pastors would, you would confess to them, tell the truth, they would listen and they would guide you somewhere towards the salvation. Uh, towards leading less uh, sinful life. Of course, they are the one, the authority who would define what is sin, who would define what is a uh, not sinful soul. And they would claim that the only type of salvation is the church. And in a similar way, uh, somewhat similar way, uh, psychotherapists, psychoanalysts, uh, again, are those who, to whom you confess, uh, who you tell the truth something you won't be even telling to your uh, dearest friend. And they are the authority that can interpret what you're saying. Of course, interpretation suggests that they impose in a certain, uh, certain terms, certain framework of interpretation. For example, the gender role, right? Uh, their own perspective. And they kind of leads towards salvation again, but it's not salvation in afterlife. 
this is this a promise uh, the promise of being saved in this life already you're going to be happy you're going to be healthy and it's presented uh, of course uh, it's maybe maybe it's less oppressive than church because church was uh, quite obviously oppressive in uh, in uh, imposing its ideas on other people with psychoanalysis it's and with psychotherapists it is presented as a care so this is what we want from inside we go to psychoanalysis because we want to or we go to other types of psychotherapy because uh, we we see it as care as taking care of us and it's our will and kind of even worse because it's your own fault <laughs> to to do it and it's your own uh, responsibility and it's even worse because if you think about it we as a psychological people there is no other type of taking care of each other for us now except for psychological because when we try to take care of our friends we do play a psychotherapist it's kind of installed really deep in us or when we try to me when i try to be mother i i do think like there is some kind of therapist observing me and i'm thinking if i'm traumatizing uh, her or if you know so I do feel it that there is this power and it's it's my fault, it's my brain function. There is this tiny psychotherapist in my brain that tells me what to do and tells me what I'm doing wrong. And there is nothing and there is no other way to take care of someone of not to, you know, not to, to do this, not to, with outside of this framework of thinking. This is who we are. And um, Maybe Freud, maybe it's Freud's uh, problem, but what was before wasn't better, right? The, the church and the religious discourse, moral discourse, it's way more patriarchal, for example. Um, you have precise roles for men and women, what they have to do, how they're supposed to be uh, saved. Um, so it wasn't better before with a moral man, it, but it's not perfect now. And I'm not sure what it's going to be in the future. So it's not it's not the way out just to abandon this whole thing because if you abandon the whole thing is suicide there is nothing else um, to do is there is no outside and this is was Foucault idea that there is no outside of the pastoral power it is because and if you try to fight it you still fight it uh, by fighting it you're still helping to uh, to establish it you're still promoting it by just fighting it it's a very tricky system. And maybe other critique, we have 20 minutes. Other critique of psychoanalysis is from the side of uh, Freud the Marxist, the Frankfurt School, uh, Horkheimer, Marcuse, and Adorno. Adorno claimed, uh, so Freud the Marxist, uh, Frankfurt School, they like mostly like Freud as a theorist. They saw uh, Freudian psychoanalytic theory as potentially um, potentially important for criticizing uh, unjust society, changing unjust society, but uh, most of them didn't like psychoanalytic practice and a practice of psychotherapy. Adorno would claim that uh, psychotherapy is prompted to become objectively untrue and therapies are frauds in adjusting to the mad hole, the uh, cure patients become really sick. So the problem with Adorno, especially with uh, ego, uh, ego therapists, uh, psychotherapists, is that they do concentrate, uh, psychotherapists, because it's individual practice, they do concentrate on the individual, on the subject, and they try to improve their mental health, to improve their, uh, to make them happy, so to say, to simplify. But the problem that uh, they exist, those individuals exist in the unjust society, society that according to Freud and Marxist is sick, is unjust, for example, patriarchal, or for example, uh, with some uh, unfair work conditions or something else. And by just taking one individual, make them happy within the circumstances of unjust society, it kind of doesn't contribute to uh, effort of the subject to make society more just. To, for the subject to become revolutionary or change, and change something because they're happy the way it is, they are. Um, and it kind of promotes or leaves uh, sick society and healthy society being untouched because people are individually fine. Uh, they, they were made happy by psychotherapists and by this they were adjusted to the sick society. For example, uh, if society is patriarchal, 
and woman is complaining that uh, her unfair condition if and she would be made happy satisfied by psychotherapies by cbt for example uh, that would mean that she would uh, not change anything in the society to be less patriarchal but she would just adjust to the society which is patriarchal this is the problem of working with individual and one of the dangers of uh, of psychotherapy individual psychotherapy also adorno criticized neo freudians those newer freudians because they're business like revisionists who follow a straight line of development between the gospel of happiness and the construction of camps of extermination so the and today more popular mass type of psychotherapy and psychoanalysis the one that sells is the one that promises a happiness the one that individual happiness uh, that associates happiness with healthiness but it's also kind of dangerous because what are we going to do with those unhappy people do we have to exterminate them the one who you know are not able to adjust are not able to become happy in the sick society uh, also freud uh, judging from freud correspondence with oscar feister oscar feister was uh, was a minister a lutheran minister and he basically claimed that uh, they have same goals for pure humanity and here was the lutheran minister uh, and that he we, you can see his misanthropy here the way he called people a trash and um, so foucault was partially right uh, judging from this correspondence that they have uh, they have uh, some similarities, some similar goals, similar project for humanity. And you can see here Freud's missionary position, like a messiah position, that his moral superiority and other people are trash and he will, he's in a position to improve them. Um, quite, uh, quite similar to some religious uh, perspectives. But late and although Freud was against religion, he was uh, considered it was considering religion uh, mass delusion. But uh, later he would claim that in the same correspondence, he would claim that he doesn't want analysis, uh, psychoanalysis to be, um, to be neither the practice of uh, doctors, medical practice, nor be something alike to practice of priests. So he wanted to separate psychoanalysis from medicine uh, for, he didn't want it to be just the cure, just the healing, uh, and he didn't want it to be um, similar to uh, to the function of priests. And again, he would claim later when he turns into Freud, I like uh, he would claim that he uh, he would abandon this missionary position that he wouldn't promise that. Uh, his uh, his inventions are primarily heal all and this is just the basis for a very grave uh, philosophy <laughs> and he would claim that he's not interested in therapy uh, so here you can see the cynical attitude the disillusion freud the void freud who claims that psychoanalysis doesn't work this is when psychoanalysis is very uh, widespread practice it does it might not work he started to doubt it they started to understand that this is uh, his failure and uh, to sander parenti uh, would claim that freud said uh, that neurotics are rabble they are only good enough to support us financially and allow us to uh, to learn from their cases psychoanalysis as a therapy may be worthless and we kind of know about it right? uh, that freud said it and it's still uh, is still a huge, uh, huge thing right now. And there is nothing, no way out of it. And the death drive, my very favorite part. We will uh, we'll have time to discuss it uh, during my next lecture. But this is the beginning of Freud of uh, the Freud that I really like. Uh, his concept was his concept of death, the death drive that was introduced in Beyond the Pleasure Principle that you're going to read, I hope. <laughs> um, uh, he, he, it was published in 1920, uh, defined as the death drive uh, towards as a drive towards death and 
destruction, but there are many, uh, there are many ways to uh, interpret it. And it wasn't initially invented by him. It was similar to Sabina. It was initially idea of Sabina Spielrein, Russian psychoanalyst, one of the first psychoanalysts. Uh, and she came with idea of uh, death instinct. Initially, she was considered crazy when she presented her, uh, her ideas. But later, in a couple of years, Freud would himself uh, reconsider his framework of thinking and would uh, agree with her and would even mention her, not even, but basically he's, he's, he's stealing her concept and mention her in some um, tiny passage in Beyond the Pleasure Principle uh, as some, uh, her idea is somewhat similar to his. So uh, Freud, the, the, the concept of a death drive, it came to substitute or uh, it, it came out after Freud understood or as it, it disrupts the understanding of uh, humans within the framework of the pleasure principle. There is something in humans that contradicts the, uh, the fact that they function in accordance with the pleasure principle, or the pleasure principle is exhaustive in understanding humans. Uh, for example, uh, when talking to war, after talking to war veterans, uh, people who came back from war and who had what we now call PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, because they have vivid memories of some traumatic events, they have nightmare of uh, traumatic events, and it just doesn't align well with uh, the pleasure principle, because according to pleasure principle, you need to forget um, some traumatic memories. You, why do you repeat the traumatic memories? And uh, Freud came up with the Freud concluded that there is something he would claim there might be a primary masochism, maybe, of course, in sexual interpretation in his case, but still, there is something uh, traumatic that we repeat, that our mind repeat. There is other principle uh, that is outside of, uh, that is not, that can be reduced to the pleasure principle, that we want pleasure and maximization of pleasure. And it also disrupts uh, this idea. And he came to admit even that pleasure, that they do exist together, pleasure principle and death drive, but death drive is a primal uh, principle, some, something that actually defines uh, humans. And it also disrupts the idea of psychoanalysis because you can't help uh, in, in, in terms of healing all the suffering from humans because humans are suffering. Uh, you can't uh, get rid of all the traumatic experiences because it, this is us who are repeating those traumatic experience. And maybe this is the core of who we are, this creative uh, dying in a creative life is dying in a creative way and there is nothing else except for it. Um, McGowan would write, the one who you also have for the seminar, McGowan would write that Freud discovered the death drive in 1920. We know that. And uh, this would disrupt his optimism. Um, and Freud as optimist kind of healed Freud from the optimist, from this first problem installed by his mother. Um, and why Freud's discovery of the unconscious disrupted the thoughts of others, psychoanalysis as uh, something to talk about unconscious, that we are not masters of our own mind that disrupts the thinking of others. The discovery of death drive disrupted his own and of his followers. And disruption makes itself felt in a halting and backtracking style of beyond the pleasure principle. Freud was never able fully to fully after this invention, not invention, but after the statement about the death drive, Freud was never able to fully revise in accordance to in according to this insight, his the scope of his thinking. But uh, because it is disruption, disruption in later works, he would it, you would still feel if you read something after Beyond the Pleasure Principle, you still feel um, that it's. He, de he thinks in terms of pleasure principle about humans, but, and then beyond the pleasure principle, you will see, you will see that he kind of tries to include it to death drive. He tries to include it in different way, different ways. He tried to give different definitions to it, but he's still not able to fully uh, go 
beyond the pleasure principle. So it does function as a disruption. It just functions as a failure. And this failure, it's functions, the failure functions as a death drive, as a repetition of traumatic, uh, of something traumatic that can't be, a, can, that can't become a part of a coherent whole. It's something that prevents the uh, harmonious flow of psychoanalysis and harmonious flow of Freud's life, of Freud's theory as a kind of hiccup, as the interruption that doesn't let uh, psychoanalysis maybe become um, coherent doctrine. And for me, so the death drive, the concept of the death drive that it that function as a, functions as an interruption in psychoanalysis is Freud's death drive, right? Freud's repetition of it was traumatic for him. It was the embodiment of his death drive, the concept of the death drive. And uh, also uh, before, uh, before the Beyond the Pleasure Principle was published in 1920, uh, Freud's father died also. It was a war period. And after the war, Freud developed depression because of his father's death and because he was struggling financially. He didn't have uh, enough money to help uh, his family. He didn't have enough patience. Um, and uh, his favorite daughter, Sophie uh, Freud, and uh, her son, one of, his, uh, one of her sons is the one who Freud mentioned in uh, Beyond the Pleasure Principle when he talks about for dog game. Uh, so one of his favorite daughter dies shortly after uh, he published uh, Beyond the Pleasure Principle. She was pregnant when she died. She died from the infection. And Freud uh, wrote a letter for her before um, before she passed away that uh, he was uh, he wanted to help her financially after he will get the money for publishing Beyond the Pleasure Principle. And um, so it was a great loss for him. It was the depression and loss uh, from which Freud would never recover. It, um, and later, it, it kind of redefined the, together the concept of a death drive and this uh, the series of great, uh, great personal uh, mourning experiences would change Freud and would make Freud that I liked the most. And he was writing in the, he became pessimistic, what this optimistic feeling himself superior, feeling arrogant. Uh, he would claim in his letter that uh, about Sophie's death, that the state of mourning uh, will subs subside. We also know uh, that it shall remain inconsolable and never find a substitute. And actually, this is uh, how it should be. It is the only way of perpetuating that love, which we don't want to relinquish. So. Here again, the death drive, the mourning, the suffering is, you know, it, it shouldn't go away. We shouldn't be happy because it preserves, uh, it preserves love. It preserves something important, maybe something that constitute us as a human. And we will try to develop based on death drive next time. The lecture is going to be on, uh, this time is death of psychoanalysis, next one is death in psychoanalysis. And for me, death is like hope. For psychoanalysis, hope <laughs> and hopelessness is hope. Because if you start instead of pleasure principle, if you start with a death drive, um, you don't start with sexuality, you don't start with heterosexual with heterosexual norm, you don't start with human as egoistic, as not being able to be altruistic, and only if there is a need, uh, they are altruistic. It's a completely different type of human. It's a suffering human, it's love that it's not that doesn't start with sexuality and it's not uh, male centered. So it's kind of, it's a death that might save psychoanalysis from all, all of this kind of flaws and that they can, that can see humans as self-sacrificing for the law as not egoistic. Uh, so it's completely different understanding of uh, the framework for understanding of human. The one that disrupts, the one that functions as a disruption of uh, of, uh, of the perception of this psychological man, psychological human that we now still exist uh, within. But we will talk about it next time. If you have questions, we have two minutes or we don't. No, tired.
Yeah. Why parents loved Freud so much? Because he was the first child and because he was very nice studying and they put a lot of effort in him. And then when he maybe they started to love uh, to have more kids, it was they didn't have time to pay so much. So it was the um, 